<laughs> or connect them. Sorry, but it's legacy language. Um, so yeah, now that it's just about to hit seven, oh, we've just had Jason Green. <laughs> Jason, before we kick off, can you just say a quick hello and tell us where you're dialing in? Connecting in from. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm from Australia, I'm in uh, Wagga. And uh, this would be my first meetup with you guys uh, in Sydney. Fantastic. And sorry, Jason, you said that you were calling in from Australia. Um, where in Australia uh, and uh, where, who do you work for doing Drupal? Yeah, so we do Drupal in uh, Wagga Wagga, so in, right. uh, in regional New South Wales. And uh, I work for a company called Angry Ant Web Design. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and it's a real pleasure to um, be hosting someone remotely for their first Wellington Drupal Meetup. Um, although, of course, it's not the Wellington Drupal Meetup, but it's the Australasian Meetup today. Um, cool. Now, I've got to keep pretty careful time. It's seven on the dot. Um, our first speaker tonight uh, is Tom Murphy from MapSequels, um, Senior Solution Architect, and he's going to be talking to us about Spark uh, LMS. Hey, take stage. Thanks, Tom. I'll be your slide changer. I'm just going to um, share our presentation and then we'll be putting slides. Yeah, that's good. Am I visible? You can look on the screen. Oh, look, I am. I'm completely, I mean, the only way I get lit is if I clock. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> That's vaguely visible. One moment. Two. And there we go. Okay, great. So, uh, Oko, uh, which is Treo for um, Learning, um, is the name of Spark's custom LMS that we built for them. Uh, even though we didn't build an LMS from scratch, Pretty much forked an existing Impinio uh, distribution, uh, which is a, a Drupal 7 and now Drupal 8 um, LMS. Uh, so I'll be talking about, we've been, had the contract with Spark for coming up to two years. Um, so this is a little story about what that journey was like. Next slide. And can I quickly just ask everyone remotely, can you give us a thumbs up if you can see the slides and if you can hear Tom okay? Fantastic. Good shit. <laughs> Okay, slide. Next slide. Cool. Uh, so Spark, when they um, came to us, they had three different closed source LMSs. It was an average age about 10 years old, which their annual license fees for. Um, they had a very limited option of deferring one year's worth of license costs uh, for a, to build an LMS. Um, and they'd never done the open source stuff in Spark, which was the possible exception of Linux, um, which I'm sure that they weren't allowed to talk to anyone in meetings. Um, so, off we go. Next slide. Yes, next slide. So, uh, we were too small for Spark, so we introduced Spark and Acquia, and Spark and Acquia talked for about a year, and after about nine months, that turned into a, a paid discovery, <laughs> um, which, you know, we thought, and we were lining up for a soft contractor gig at that point, and we thought, oh, okay, this is going to be all right, maybe. So, they didn't really seem to know about anything about LMSs, and the whole thing had actually just started with someone that we knew who worked at Spark, um, who uh, was like, surely there's an open source version of some of this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, there is. There's this and this and this. That's kind of where the ball started rolling. Anyway, so paid discovery, we're thinking, right, something's going to happen. Next slide. However, I think the people inside Spark were like, yeah, yeah, it's a really big deal. Yeah. And Acro was like, yeah, it's a really big deal. Going to add a zero. I'm going to add another zero. So when they actually found out how much money there was, which was like, Close to nothing. I think it was like you know 150k license annual license fees. They're like, we can't build you an LMS for 150k. Give us a million dollars, we'll give you uh, well contractually nothing, um, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll just give you full agile for like you know a million or two. Uh, so we were just like <laughs> the music was going down. Uh, it was all falling apart. Contract negotiations and lawyers. And we were like, oh, God damn it, it's all over. Next slide. I'm a down on Joe Right. Uh, so Spark was sitting there like going, damn. Okay, we've got six weeks before we have to pay the license again. Uh, do you want to switch on Opinio? And we're like, what, on our own? And we're like, okay. If uh, the condition was we had to accept, we had to base a contract on their standard contractor terms, not on Acquia's like <laughs> 150 pages of legal doom. Um, sorry, Acquia, if you're around. Um, yeah, Dallas is from Acquia, but he's all good. 
He knows what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Acre's amazing. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, no, we had a good we had a good chat with several people from Acre afterwards, and they, they thought it was an interesting learning process. Uh, anyway, so they came. Spark Edge was direct, and uh, we sort of said hello to Acre, and they're like, Rrr. so um, next slide. So we're insane. We said yes. Um, so we had to after contract negotiations, um, which took three days. We had five and a half weeks to replace three different LMSs in production, uh, starting from zero. Uh, so this was where we had to flip to. You just click through. Sorry, I was excellent. Okay, you can click through now. <laughs> right. So the main thing was like uh, your ten-year-old piece of shit. Uh, you get exactly that to go into production again, because that's what you would have paid for if you'd renew the license. So that's where the contract started off. So that's all we have to compete with is 10 year old LMS software. I made it loads easier. Um, and we just switched on, we thought, okay, we switched on Opinio, it does everything, and all the features match, we just pitch out, and we just, we just import the content, you get raw CSV exports, next slide. Uh, and then this is our usual Pantheon, Carbon and Trello, lots of stupid memes. Um, this is our general approach. Um, we thought, yeah, 12,000 users, we'll just import them. 108,000 user records, yeah, we can get more CSVs, we'll just import them, no problem. Next slide. Uh, so at this point, and it's cutting off here, we're like on the skinny end here, right? So we're just like, yeah, great, we'll just switch it on. We haven't modified the we'll just switch it on. Next slide. Okay, cool. Uh, now, you whole thing is breaking my slides, mate. I can't even read anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just drag it on. Yeah, that's good. So, it's sounding good at this point, but premise one, knowledge is power. Premise two, power corrupts. Conclusion, therefore, <laughs> knowledge corrupts. Next slide. These are actually, as stuff melted down to various degrees, these are, these are memes from the Trello board, which we were sharing with the client. Um, so the only problem is Opinio's dev team um, were a new PHP, they didn't know Drupal, uh, and their development approach was borrowing a tunnel through solid rock when they could have taken a train. Um, so next slide. Uh, they'd written, rewritten huge chunks of Drupal, like in the theme layer, had no idea anything works. Uh, <laughs> stuff that we thought was views was actually hand-coded PHP um, reports <laughs> because they couldn't get the truth. So there was a lot of pain, and uh, we had like five or six weeks where people were doing the same hours. But next up, we did launch on the day, uh, and um, we had lots of challenges with what the opinion data model was, what the Spark data model was. Um, the team, the internal Spark team dealing with the project was too big, uh, which is where the stupid memes came from. We started to introduce more and more stupid in-jokes, and the more people at Spark couldn't understand the in-jokes, right, we're out of the chain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Got to the point there were no idiots on awesome the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we had all kinds of surprises. Like the UIDs that were strings which didn't actually have. Oh, oh, it's lowercase t. It's an uppercase t here. And, this, and it, it, basically, I asked this our product owner now, which is the second product owner. Can I say that you're a little bit confused? And he says, Sure. What a large corporation doesn't have these problems. So like, the big challenge for us was we were used to dealing with companies that were like a scale smaller. And we, when we talked to a company, we thought we were talking to a company, but actually it's a giant anarchic community of different departments that barely communicate. Um, so the main assumption is just because that's what you say, who knows what they're going to say. So once we stabilize into that. Next, oh yeah, Spark Security versus Google Cloud. You're dealing with like 20 years difference in definition of what's standard and what's safe. That was a major challenge. Better keep going. Next slide. So we had to go to the next level. <laughs> so few people noticed that the bald guy had changed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. <laughs> um, so by this point, we're kind of up to here. We've launched, um, we've got a support contract, we've got a continuing development project, and that was the point where, okay, now we've, we've, we've won it, and now we're extensible, right? So suddenly we can like go, we've wanted to be able to export this, or we want to be able to do this report for years. Okay, we've just added a view, or we've just added this block, and we're starting to actually get like native dribble running. Next slide. <laughs> this is pretty much we're getting to the next uh, level there, and just go straight on. Um, so, <laughs> uh, every time it just seemed like things made sense, we just had to just change it up the next level. Next slide. Uh, and then finally, things were like uh, going really well. Um, 
it's amazing how much progress was made just through stupid memes. Um, and I'm, I'm making more memes at this point than I did from the internet. Next slide. Uh, however, <laughs> um, so uh, so I'd been running the project up until this point. I went on holiday because um, I, I was uh, uh, I because you'd earned it. But yes, because I'd earned it in more ways than one. Um, so we went through we, we went through another couple of project managers, and I ended up taking it back. Um, so then we had some bumps as it started to get too big. Um, as we didn't have enough handover and we had some bumps. So bring it on. Next slide. At this point, we've got this massive fat, done about a year. We actually started in February. We'll start in February, launched April 1st. We come through April 1st, April Fool's Day, um, was the D8 launch because we planned to spend a year on D7 just because we had a feature set, feature complete LMS in D7, which was Opinion. But the, uh, Pinio had no DA port. Um, uh, Pinio had a DA port uh, about six months, nine months into it. Um, and then we started building all this extra functionality of parallel LMS, which was based around how they wanted to do things, not about how Cornerstone, the legacy system, or how Pinio works. It wasn't SCORM based. Anyone knows what a SCORM is? Yeah, so, uh, so that's just like an international shared content object relationship model learning thing. And that's what Spark was running on. We had about 1,000 SCORMs in. Uh, 108,000 records, probably more like 300,000 now, uh, 12,000 users. Um, so we've got this live thing, but we're like, okay, we're not going to start building any really complicated features in 7, we have to start building them in 8. Uh, we'll just take the D8 opinion report, and I'm not really running it. But then this giant tornado of features collides with an April 1st launch date, and... Uh, Again. Yes, <laughs> and uh, and then doesn't work. Next slide. Um, so I, I I get onto the project again, and I had to like, well, first thing I want to do is have a decent meme. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> uh, but it was really unpleasant, um, and there's <coughs> a lot of confusion. Uh, so next next slide. Um, but gradually, through a series of stupid memes, I, I started to like make everyone communicate. I'm noticing a pattern of uh, the content not being congruent with itself. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's <laughs> the point. That's what the first one is, use for Gandalf. Just continue the chat. Next slide. Okay, cool. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, we had massive problems with what you think is a SCORM isn't a SCORM because the fundamental of a SCORM is an XML manifest of what everything is. Unfortunately, the way different software products which were claiming to export SCORMs weren't SCORMs and we're introducing extra manifests in different places, like a Git repo inside a Git repo, um, and everything was exploding. And we're like, well, we don't have to support it because it's not SCORM contractually, but it's not a SCORM, which is a thing. We don't have to support it. But we eventually came up with this 15 set procedure how to clean up all their legacy broken SCORMs. And then they're like, this list is long. So therefore, I made this. Yo, dog, you got SCORMs in your SCORMs? Just unzip your zip and zip back that zip without the ship, which is basically <laughs> what the 15. <laughs> <laughs> this is all client facing. It's really <laughs> great. It's great. It was a really great team to work with um, because the, the people who got anything done were ridiculously funny and could actually get stuff done. There was various other people who were very process oriented and very important and couldn't follow it. It was too complicated. And just using stupid jokes to filter out anyone else that wasn't following it was really useful. Next slide. Um, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> 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 okay. um, so, uh, uh, in order to get over that, we just got too big. We started hiring on board contractor developers. Um, so, we had to have much more rigid trailer structure um, where, as stuff ping ponged between uh, from X equals to the person in X equals back to X equals back to Spark, back to the person at Spark, pinging it back, especially considering their SAT team was based in India. Their, business intelligence team didn't talk to their SAML team. And so in terms of whose fault it was, then that would like spiral for quite a while. So we needed to like structure how that was happening. Um, we had to like, here's one of the main problems was that if Spark was messing up, our team would cover for it. So that that would draw on two or three months. And um, eventually when we didn't have the feature, then it would be like, 
yeah, but we've been trying to like code around the fact that your data's wrong, even though you said no, and, and that was causing the problem. Whereas then we switched it to, if they didn't match their own spec, we didn't build anything. We told them on day one, they are not gonna build this. You've broken the deadline because your data's wrong based around your own rules. That really helped. Oh, also, we got to the point where um, we rigorously mixed what branches, what features was linked to what sections of the contract, and we realized there'd be a huge gap because um, if we go we click on to the next one, I think we're going to get next one. Next one, I think. No, go back a bit. Go back a bit until I get to the arrows. I want some arrows. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Um, what we got to here, um, you see how big this is? That's the D8 Pinot port. Um, that does what that does. We've got that huge fat thing, um, which we didn't actually factor on porting. And in fact, that was harder to port because a lot of that was existing D7 version to yours and DA. So what we did was during this period, we just paid for it ourselves and um, <coughs> covered it. And then once we'd actually made that exist, which was expensive, but it was a good strategic decision, then they started paying for everything again. So basically making the money back to the point where we'd forgotten to ask for the funding. They couldn't make the funding appear because that's not how the contractual structures function. You're waiting like six months, a year, maybe two years in some cases to make money available. So if you're too stupid to ask for something a year early, that's your problem and, and you have to pay for it. Um, anyway, let's, let's get back to where we were. You got, um, time, you've got five minutes left. No problem, I'm nearly at the end. Oh, go back, go back. Don't get to the monkey. <laughs> um, so yeah, so by this point we'd also included uh, links to all their business intelligence systems, uh, so performance dashboards for about one and a half thousand front end, front line um, call center staff uh, with all their metrics then getting processed and related to their learning record so they could get like instructions about what extra learning they had to do based on how they're performing with different aspects of interacting with customers. Um, and we also had a, a parallel learning system we also had an extra 3,000 people that are um, subcontractors that also needed to access the system for legal compliance. Because a lot of this training isn't just like, oh, well, we fancy just giving some people some training. A lot of it's to do with legal compliance or ISA <laughs> compliance in terms of what people actually have to know how to do um, in terms of get access to the backbone network. Um, so we just extended it to a whole class of non-SAML people. So we went from like 10,000 SAML users to probably an additional three to 4,000 password registration users and another 200 subcontracting companies, uh, which are now paying Spark to access the system that we built for them. So this is now becoming like partially self-funding. Amazing. Next one up. Uh, well, we had some like vicious technical problems. One of my favorites was uh, uh, group permission scaling. James, that was fun, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, where uh, basically Opinio had hacked the permission system to bypass uh, any access checks for group content. Um, and the way we built a feature meant that we were getting 20 to 30,000 different lookups per page view. Um, and when we were looking for slow queries, there weren't any, because the queries are relatively fast. It's just that there was like 20 to 30,000 of them. Uh, so what we did was we um, we just rewrote group, didn't we really? Mm -hmm. Oh, we applied the patch. We applied the patch from Yeah, we just like, yeah. <laughs> Um, but this was uh, one of the memes at the time because they um, they didn't want anyone to have the rights to delete, so we couldn't bypass access permissions, which then meant this massive performance happened. So we just put the delete option back by doing a permissions bypass. It's the uh, the void. Next one, and that's my last slide. <laughs> Uh, any um, questions? I've got two minutes. Well, I was going to suggest that you use the last few minutes maybe the demo. Yeah, sure. Um, Unless before... anyone's got questions, otherwise I'll default to demo. Live demo. Live demo. You want to see some stuff? Yes, right. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, here we are. Hello. Well, just give me the, um, let's give me the incognito window first. Oh, right, yeah. Oh, this is this. This is this. this is no, I've got it right. That's a line. Cool. Here we go. That's good. All right. Okay. Tom. So Tom is just jumping behind the computer to go through. Okay. Cool. So we're on the dev site at the moment because the test site's got a whole bunch of dumb content changes that I made as part of a pre-deployment test. Um, but it's it's identical to um, what's going to be on the live site tomorrow night. Um, and basically, you've got free sign, sign up from a, as a whitelisting system based around um, what domain 
uh, like Downer, Chorus, a whole bunch of companies, you can whitelist register, which is stored inside the Drupal database. That's if you've got an existing Drupal database login, and that is if you've got a SAML login. Right? I'm not going to go through the SAML system, but just to give you a sense that that's how you get into the system, and that's what you see if you're not authenticated. Um, this is my admin account, and most people will see this stuff, which is a picture of them, that's my happy face. Um, and so you can find a course and go like, oh hey, I need to do Bryce's course. It's running slow because it's on a dev environment, but the, um, it's reasonably, reasonably perky in the production environment. Um, and then you get an option of like starting a storm thing, and that launches a storm, you do a you go through their internal learning systems. Do, do, do. Thank you, Bella. Great. And I just coach you through their private support, which I won't show you because that would be uh, breach confidential information. Um, so if we go back here, then I'll really breach it because you can see that um, course reporting. So we rewrote all of the opinion stuff. We're pretty much forked. We're not really on opinion anymore because it was, it was just too well, I haven't actually logged into anything yet. Yeah. I guess people are going to Yeah, so I'm, this, is, this is my admin account. So I'm opt-in for the non incognito tab. Okay. Sorry about that, yeah. Um, so this is like, you know, this is all live user data. So this is all, and this is all like that. Uh, uh, this is course reporting. Um, this is the, uh, oh, it doesn't matter. No, you're filming, mate. God damn. Um, this is the learning catalog, and this is all the stuff, and you can basically search by stuff that you're into. That's my search thing. Um, go search. So it's basically what we've done is like built an LMS with the CMS. It's just an object model. And all of a sudden they're like, wow, this is totally better than anything on the market. So the, 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 C, the LMS market is um, super flabby. Um, if we go to, I'll show you some performance dashboards. Anything else want, anybody particularly wants to see? Well, that's totally fine because I'm running out of ideas. Sure. Can you use content across different courses? Yes, you can, but they don't choose to. Um, but yeah, we, we spent a lot of time trying to optimize what their content model was, but then we realized that they, that was part of an internal culture and what they really was was something to enable their current culture. Right. So they're actually like, they've got one score per learning thing. We've also built all this extra uh, functionality for internal content, which they don't use. And we've got this extra functionality for video-based content, which is like, so they've got a team of people making storms, and they export them, and we import them, and then we just record the data, we affect access to them, we affect notifications around getting access to them, and we just sort of say, okay, is that how you want to roll? We'll do that, and we'll just enable you. Um, which keeps them happy, and it keeps them unflowing, and keeps us reasonably happy. Um, and we got a dashboard, still we've got a dashboard. The system does support, support reusable modules, so you could have a set of questions that would occur in a number of different courses or learning models. They just choose not to do use that. Dashboard there. Right, any other questions? Why don't you go back there and um, I'll go back to the video. Sure. Um, before we go into questions, so just th thank you, Tom, for presenting on that. So, uh, Owen Lansbury will be phoning in, but he's not here yet. Okay. Um, so, just do Q&A, and then when Owen arrives, we'll have to trans transition to that, because he said he had to be gone um, within 20 minutes for Owen. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm really? here, Alex. I'm here. Oh, you are. Sweet. I'm off this. I'm off this. Oh, all good. Well, um, good timing to wrap that up then. Um, let me just cancel the screen share. Oh my god. god <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I didn't realize I had to give the time to call. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that is something. Can I just do a quick round of applause for how many people have actually joined? This is amazing. <laughs> okay, and in the interest of time, uh, we are just going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> just a quick theme picture. <laughs> um, Owen. 
Um, we'll put ourselves on mute for now, and if you could um, take it away and uh, give us your Drupal Association updates. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, so I'm obviously not Philip, and I'm not talking about Raspberry Pi. Uh, unfortunately, that had to be shuffled around, and I got pulled in at the last second to talk about Drupal South. Uh, for you, those of you that don't know me, Owen Lansbury, uh, work with the Drupal South Steering Committee, also on the Drupal Association Board. You might have seen me at uh, Drupal South in Hobart. Um, in terms of housekeeping, if you do have questions, just throw them in the chat window. There's a little link to that at the bottom of the Zoom screen there. And I'll put a couple of links in there for things that I'm gonna talk about. Um, so apologies, this won't be as humorous as, as that last one and I haven't drunk as much beer as the Kiwis uh, to get through my little session here. Um, so just to kick off, uh, for those of you that aren't aware of how Drupal South is now structured, last year we put together a, um, a, a steering committee uh, and the purpose of that is so that we can oversee multiple activities and events in, in the longer term and have a bit more continu continuity than we'd had in previous years. Uh, we're actually governed by Linux Australia, so we report to them on our financials. They provide us with bank accounts uh, and all of our accounting procedures that we need to go through. Uh, but then our link to the Drupal Association at a global level is if they have policies that are relevant to us adopting at a local level, then we adopt them. And a good example of that is the, uh, the code of conduct for our events. Uh, and then the other thing is that we've got uh, good interaction with them at a global level. So there's a, a local organizers or event organizers working group at a, at a global level and Chris Skeen's involved in that. And that's basically sharing best practice across events and things like that. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about uh, how we've been listening to you so far. Uh, and the major thing that we did at Drupal South Hobart was run a bunch of uh, boffs for different audiences uh, to get input and feedback about what people are finding is important for them. And I've just posted some links to some blog posts that we wrote after those events that go into more detail about what was discussed. Um, but just in summary, we had the first ever time that uh, Drupal South sponsors had sat down together and talked about what's important to them as, as sponsors of the event, but also uh, for their businesses focused on Drupal more generally. Uh, we also had a local organizers off with people that run meetups uh, and training and, and other local events. Uh, and one of the outcomes of that is this right here. Um, so being able to amalgamate our meetups into something that's a bit more regional and high levels of attendance uh, and more feedback and interaction than you might get uh, just in your, your local meetups. And then the final one was uh, an event organizers boff where we talked about what's been working well at Drupal South, what hasn't, things that we could be doing to improve the format of uh, the conferences themselves, and then other events that we might start looking at. Um, so feel free to read those blogs in your own time. I'm presuming you probably haven't already. Uh, and all of that then fed into uh, a strategic initiatives document that we've put together as the steering committee. And I'm putting a link to that in the chat window as well. And I'll, I'll just go through that in a little bit more detail, uh, just so that you're aware of where we're, we're focusing our efforts. So um, after taking feedback from people, getting input, uh, what we did was a process of prioritizing where our focus should be in terms of what's going to have the highest impact uh, versus what's going to have the, the most involvement required to get things off the ground. Uh, and this document basically outlines in order of priority what these initiatives are. Um, so as I said, the, the primary uh, uh, focus of the steering committee is to ensure continuity across events. Um, and that involves things like um, selecting teams to run events in different locations well in advance, giving them guidance and sharing knowledge about what's worked well at previous events, um, having standardized tools in terms of accounting and reporting and using a, uh, the same website every time instead of building it from scratch each time. Uh, and then more uh, functional things around maintaining databases of who's sponsored previously, who's attended previously, how do we 
re reach out to them. Uh, and I think we've obviously got our Drupal South events, um, but we've also got Drupal Gov uh, as one of the events that we're overseeing. And we may have other audience specific events that we start rolling out over time as we get a bit more bandwidth to focus on those. Um, and I think the overall goal for us is, yes, we do want to grow event attendance over time. Um, it's not the only um, measure of success, but it, it is definitely something that we can point to and say, yep, over the past three years, we've grown by 10, 20% in terms of attendance. And that shows that we've got a thriving community and, and an engaged community. Um, the other thing that we've talked about, and this obviously came out of the boff that we ran in Hobart, is um, how do we provide Drupal Meetup, smaller camps, community training and sprints with financial and operational support? Um, and I think that the message here is that uh, uh, we want to be able to facilitate communication between the various meetups. And there's now a Slack channel that's been set up for local organisers to communicate through. And that might be things like, hey, has anyone got any speakers that can speak at our meetup as well, um, rather than doing a, a, a call out in your own local area. Um, uh, common tools. So if you are needing to promote your event, we've now got a platform through DrupalSouth.org to do that um, through the official Twitter accounts, those types of things. Um, and feel free to reach out if you need to use those. Um, and then I think the important thing to convey here is if you are looking at running local events, please reach out to the steering committee for funding for those. So um, the way that we've been running our Drupal South events, we have been very fiscally responsible and we have been generating uh, reasonable profits over the last few years out of those and we have access to those to then distribute back into the community where we think it's um, appropriate so if you're looking at running a local camp or um, you're needing pizza for your meetups and those types of things um, please reach out to us i think in terms of meetup funding we're probably going to move to a standardized model um, whereby each meetup gets a fixed amount each year and you can spend that as you see fit uh, and we're just working through with Linux Australia to, to work out what the, uh, the model around that might be. Um, and then the next thing to talk about is annual sponsorship packages. So this is a very early stage at the moment um, but now that we have a calendar set up of uh, we've got two big events locked in in the next 12 months, we've got some other initiatives starting to, to get um, traction. Uh, we raised this with the sponsors at Drupal South Hobart and there was generally a good response to if we offered an annual sponsorship package, would that be something you're interested in as a sponsor? Uh, and that obviously simplifies things across the board for everyone, whereby we can say, these are all the events and initiatives we're running in the next year. Here's a price for you to have exposure at those rather than us coming back to you each time and asking for, for more money. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ideas around what those types of things might uh, look like in terms of exposure. Um, so obviously the events, but if we're starting to run uh, promotion at non-Drupal events and, and being able to feed leads through to our Drupal South sponsors, then that's something that we're, we're starting to look at as well. Um, regional marketing initiatives. So this is something which is probably going to take a little bit longer to get off the ground. Um, but what we are looking at is how can we grow the message about Drupal uh, in uh, technology media and across social media channels so that um, there's more awareness of what, what's happening with Drupal as a product, but then also as a community. Um, and I think at the moment it's very ad hoc in terms of what those communications look like. Uh, and if we're solely relying on the Drupal Association to do that at a global level, it's not necessarily talking to our local and regional audiences about things that they're, they're most interested in. Um, so there's a few initiatives that we're starting to look at uh, that are listed there. Uh, and then one of the things that we're starting to look at in terms of budget is whether we should be looking at bringing on a marketing coordinator in a retains uh, capacity, um, obviously as a, a paid engagement, but to have someone whose sole focus is, is to be promoting Drupal on a continuous basis. Um, and essentially that's a market development activity so that uh, the more people that are aware of Drupal, the more decision makers that have got Drupal in their consideration, 
different mix uh, that's then feeding down in terms of RFQs that are coming out that companies that we work for can respond to win and then obviously drive growth of the market as a whole. Um, uh, one day decision maker summits uh, is something that we're also looking at uh, and in my role with the Drupal Association board I'm actually involved in the coordinating team for their executive summit at DrupalCon Minneapolis and the idea there is that if we get the format right uh, that's something that we can start rolling out internationally as well that would have uh, Drupal Association backing so that we'd have an official event that's targeted at um, key decision makers, CTOs, CMOs, CIOs, etc., uh, and that those summits become a way for us to really push Drupal as a, um, a very viable option for them to be considering. Um, so that summit in Minneapolis is going to be run in May. And then I'd say shortly thereafter, we'll be able to start looking at how can we run that regionally. Um, and I think just so that everyone's aware, um, it might be a case that we run one in Auckland or Wellington or Sydney or Melbourne. Um, it wouldn't ne necessarily be a national event. It'd be probably quite small, um, very targeted in terms of, of who we want to attend that. Um, and then the final thing on this list is engaging with the Asia Pacific community. Um, and th this is a kind of, broader goal uh, for us to be able to start engaging beyond our region a little bit more. Uh, and the first step of that was I was up in Tokyo a couple of weeks ago, met a bunch of different uh, community organizers, a bunch of different companies that are operating up in Japan, just to get a sense of where they're at as a, as a market and as a community and to find out what types of things that we might be able to share with them, um, both as Drupal South or as the Drupal Association to get their communities humming a little bit more effectively. And then also understanding what are the nuances between markets within Asia Pacific that we'd need to be aware of. Um, and of course, the first question was, when will DrupalCon be run as a, an Asia Pacific event? Um, and my answer to that is probably not anytime soon, but it's a nice aspiration to have uh, in, in the longer term. Um, and having said that, that's definitely not going to take any focus off us running um, Drupal South events at a regional level. Um, so feel free to read through that in more detail. Feel free to um, make any comments uh, or contact us if you've got ideas that you think that we should be focusing on. Um, and I think one of the things to point out for this audience is we do want the Drupal community to be reaching out to other technology communities in a more active way. Um, there's a lot of complementary technologies that Drupal's a natural fit with, uh, whether that be front-end frameworks or LMS style functionality that we, we just saw. Um, and one way that we think that we can drive that is by having uh, really good uh, people who can speak about Drupal, who can then go off and talk at other conferences, other meetups and, and things like that. So if that's something that you're interested in, please reach out and, and let us know. And I think what we'll move towards is just compiling a list of people that might be available to, to speak. Um, if we hear of an event that might be appropriate, we'll reach out to that list uh, and see who might be available to, to speak at those types of things. Um, and likewise, if you hear of events that you think Drupal should have a presence at, um, then reach out to us and let's see if we can coordinate something around that. Um, then just specifically in terms of major events that we've got coming up. Uh, so the first one is Drupal Gov being held in Canberra uh, in early November 2020. And uh, that's going to be run as a one day event for sessions. We're going to have one day of a code sprint after the, um, the day of sessions. And then there's talk that we'll be able to hopefully time it so that the Gov CMS mega meetup is then held on the third day. So if we can pull that off, then it'll mean that we've got three days of really kind of focused Drupal related uh, activities and, and content all happening in Canberra at the same time. Uh, and uh, the local event organizers for that uh, Akil Bandari from Salsa, and he's also being assisted by Kim Fan uh, at this point in time. Again, if you're interested in helping with that event, they'll be looking for volunteers and putting out a, a call out for volunteers, and then there'll be 
calls for session proposals and things like that, hopefully within the next couple of months. Uh, and then the next big event beyond that is Wellington in early March 2021. Uh, and Alex and the X equals guys have put their hand up to facilitate that as local event organizers. And again, there'll be more communication coming out about that once we, um, we get moving with things. But uh, we do have a fantastic venue already booked in uh, and it'll be quite quick once we kind of get moving with, with that as well. Um, I do have a note, but I can't even read my own handwriting for the next thing. <laughs> um, the other thing that we've set up is a career pathways working group. So one of the big things that came out of both the uh, local organizers BOF and also the sponsors BOF was how are we growing new developers into the Drupal community? Um, how are they finding out about Drupal? How are we, um, training them up, how are we then offering them potentially internships with companies that use Drupal and how does that then lead to a career in Drupal uh, and Cy Hobbs has uh, set that working group up. There's about six or seven people on it from around the region uh, and they've just had their first month of looking at the types of initiatives that they might be able to, to get moving with. Um, and I'd say that at a certain point, they'll be making more public announcements around what those initiatives might be and how we can all help with that. Um, I've talked about the executive summits that we're likely to run. Uh, and then at a global level, we've got uh, DrupalCon Minneapolis coming up in May. Uh, I think the sessions uh, that were selected were just of the speakers were notified in the last couple of days about that. And I know that there's a few Australian and New Zealanders that have been selected. Uh, and then DrupalCon Barcelona will be held in uh, mid-September and their call for session proposals hasn't come out yet. Um, the other thing that, or the things that the Drupal Association, Association is working on is uh, a contribution recognition working group. Uh, and for those of you familiar with Drupal.org, there's a Drupal.org slash services section that lists all of the companies contributing code to Drupal. Uh, and this working group's assessing what are the measures of contribution that should be recognized. Is it, it's definitely not solely code uh, and there's, there's recognition of that. So what are the other things like event volunteering, speaking at events, sponsoring events uh, that would contribute to those rankings in the, in the services listing. Um, and then the step that that is then leading towards is a restructuring of how companies are represented on Drupal.org. So at the moment, it's a real mishmash, mishmash of your listing in the services rankings. Um, you might be an organization, organization member, you might be a supporting partner, you might be a sponsor of, of different events. And they're trying to consolidate that into a, a single approach. Um, that's probably not gonna look dissimilar to uh, kind of gold, silver and bronze uh, preferred partners or supporting partners. Um, so that it's clearer to the market around what companies are contributing uh, the most to Drupal and who should you be talk talking to if you're wanting to get your projects built. Um, and a much longer term ambition that hasn't had any um, real thought put into it at this point in time is a more generic uh, Drupal developer certification program that's not tied to any specific vendor that uh, the Drupal Association would facilitate. Uh, and again, that would be moving towards an approach whereby if your company has a certain number of certified developers, if you're ranked at a certain level uh, within Drupal.org, um, then your profile and recognition would be ranked uh, accordingly. Um, and just as I wrap up, uh, if you're not already a Drupal Association member, you can become a, uh, an individual developer member uh, or an organization member. And then obviously there's su their supporting partner program. Uh, and that just gives you more profile at a, at a global level. Um, I will wrap up. Um, if you do have questions, um, we've probably run out of time, but feel free to contact us through drupalsouth.org. There's a little contact button. You can send an email and that'll come through to the steering committee and we can then talk about that and get back to you. Uh, and then most of us are all on uh, the Drupal AU NZ Slack channel. So 
feel free to ping us directly if, if you wanted to talk about anything there. Um, who's actually coordinating this meetup? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wellington is coordinating, yeah. um, I think. I, I think. Um, Who do I hand uh, over to? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take it from here on. Um, but firstly, just want to give you a massive thanks for that really succinct breakdown. Thank you. Um, I, I think the timing of this is incredible. You know, just to have you here giving us updates uh, from the Drupal South Committee um, while we've got all these different people um, phoned into the same uh, video call at the same time, it's absolutely amazing. So. Yep, and yeah. feel, feel free to ping me if uh, anyone's ever got any thoughts or okay. ideas. I do have to step off, unfortunately. All right, roger that. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. And uh, this is sort of global cat herding, so um, uh, bear with us here. But I think next up is going to be Vladimir from Brisbane. Uh, Vladimir, are you there? Yep, can everyone hear me? Oh, fantastic. I've got to say, this whole IT setup has been bloody flawless so far. Yeah. I mean, touch wood. Yeah, touch wood. Thank you. Hey, as soon as it works. Yeah. <laughs> All good. So, um, Vladimir, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for making time to speak to us tonight about uh, tokens in Drupal 8. They're a proprietary company. Excellent. I mean, they're a bigger fan. How do I share things here? There you go. Big green button. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes, I can see. Yes. That. Thumbs up. Excellent. All right, so my name is Vladimir. I'm based in Brisbane. I'm looking after a few things. Um, I'm doing uh, every Drupal Global Training Day, and first time in April we're running it online. So feel free to sign up or pass anyone. The topic for April would be intermediate platform development. I'm also organizing Drupal Camp Baron Bay. Uh, we are trying to make it more dev day. Um, kind of event based on the feedback from last year. So finally, the venue has been confirmed. We've been bounced twice. So it's 27th of June, Iron Bay at Saturday. Uh, we might extend uh, to Friday like we did last year. There's enough people interested in coming to Friday, but at the moment, just one day to track uh, kind of event. I will try to do a lot of hands-on sessions. So feel free to ping me about those. And without further ado, I'll uh, jump into tokens. I had a few issues with my Chrome, but I'll try to do live demo. So if it's not working, I have a couple of screenshots. And if the screen is not loaded fast enough, just let me know. I'll try to, uh, I'll try to do, uh, do this jiggling. All right, so tokens. If you haven't heard about tokens, you probably installed the module called Path Order before. And when you install a module called Path Order, you actually are required to install uh, tokens. So if you try to install Path Order, it will say, yep, I need a module called token. You download module token. So if you actually go to the module token here, uh, you can see there is only help. And it basically gives you a list of uh, placeholders. And that's what tokens are. So they've been there from I think, Drupal 5 uh, for a very, very, very long time and kind of made their way. They're quite useful. And I'll show you a few use cases where you can use them properly uh, and see if you can actually yeah, use them in your next project. So the first thing, as I said, path order requires uh, Drupal token module. So if we'll go to path order settings, path order looks after um, URL, kind of pretty URL thing. So if you go to a particular content, if you go to a recipe like this one, there you go, Chrome's playing up again. You can see the URL right here is uh, recipes slash chowder. Obviously, you can insert it manually. 
but to make it more automated, that's the path order module is um, there for. So if you go to search in metadata and configuration and into URL analysis, there we can configure patterns. So the list of um, all the analysis are here, but if you click on patterns, by default, you won't see anything here. So I'll just delete stuff I did for recipe. And add a new path for the pattern. So in this particular case, I will be targeting recipe content type. In case anyone interested, I'm using the Umami uh, demo thing, hence the message. And I'm using Clara on the back end, uh, which is a new uh, admin thing. So it would ask you the path pattern. And you can see from my auto pop up, I can use, I use a few patterns. I know that the recipe pattern is recipe is slash. And then uh, it actually goes for a token. So if we don't know what token is or which particular token, there is a helpful window, it's going to pop up. Basically the same thing we saw in help. And uh, here we would go to the node because recipes are the nodes and we're looking for a title. If you're looking for ID, for example, recipe slash 11 or slash 53, that's the way to go. Um, we'll be looking for a title. So you can see, you can scroll forever. So, off. so here you go, node title. So you can insert token here and it will be processed. And uh, yeah, I'll select all languages. Save pattern here. So now every time I'll go and create or replicate the recipe. If I click right on uh, edit all my latest recipe and click replicate. Add something like corn salad. I don't know what corn salad in Spanish, sorry. But we can do that. You can see the URL change uh, recipes from salad. Now, tokens are quite a serious tool and make sure you use the right one because sometimes it can give you a very, very unexpected behavior if you're using the wrong token. So actually before that I was playing around and I put um, just for all the nodes except recipes. I put current page title and that actually gave me a very weird result. For example, one of the pages, it actually picked up the title of the edit form. So if you look at Drupal Cam Byron by here, it actually, the, uh, the title it picked up was create basic page. So make sure you use the correct token for the correct uh, entity. So if you're using taxonomy, use taxonomy name. If you're using nodes, use node title and so on and so forth. Just make sure. So if you see some gibberish in the URL analysis, um, then uh, yeah, uh, feel free to poke around and see if you can regenerate them, which is quite easy to do. Again, configuration, search in metadata, URL analysis. And from here, we have bulk generate where we can set up pick up a specific entity and just regenerate all your else if you really want. So in our case, if I want to change the pattern for page and articles, instead of current page, I put node and ID. Save it and uh, go to bulk generate. Click uh, regenerate all the content. Unfortunately, you cannot pick up the specific content type. Project regenerate. Uh, 
Then we go to the content. So MAD is there. But you can see if I, while, while I'm hovering over the content, it's still cached. So you still get an old URL, which is create basic page. But now it's actually displaying no ID. So it just has ID of 20. EM English appears there because it's a multilingual website. So mm -hmm. mommy is a multilingual too. All right, so let's um, play with something more interesting. So usually you'd see a copyright block on the bottom and you obviously doesn't want your client to sit with a website that says copyright from seven years ago. So you probably create something like um, custom block. Place it on the bottom. Okay, copyright 2021. And you put full HTML there. And what is different? We have copyright. Here. And then we probably want to put it somewhere in the footer or all the way to the bottom on this part of the file. Save block. So it would be good if we can use a token to actually uh, have a current year there. That would be great. So if we look at the moment on our homepage, you can see it's copyright 2021. If I'll go to my tokens, stuff here. So to access list of tokens, I, I can do it from the modules page. Here, go to help. And if I'll search something like today. There's a current date. And if we go, current date custom, I know according to PHP documentation, custom year would be Y. So I'll just copy this particular token. Go to my blocks. Picture block layout, custom block library. Edit my copyright. The token here. Save it. Was updated. So if we go back. As you can see, it's actually disappeared. That's interesting. Okay, so to help us to actually process tokens, yeah. Yeah, cache issues again. There you go. So if we look at the source tokens, definitely there, it's not being processed. So in order to process token, uh, there is a module called the uh, token filter. So token filter actually allows us to um, put a token filter on one of the text formats and process your filters. So it's, you probably have seen it's already enabled. Token filter here. So the way to enable the token filter is if we go to um, content author, text format and editors. And because we're using full HTML, I'll just configure full HTML, just to make sure it's actually uh, quick and easy. So the first you'll see there's a button here called Token Browser. You can actually browse particular tokens. You can edit your video in tools, for example. 
But if you look for the token, you can see there's replace global and entity tokens with their values. So if you select that, maybe drag it to the top if you want to over the filters, save it. I'm just not sure if we need to save this particular one, but if I refresh that, copyright question mark. Oh, I forgot to change it to a year. I cannot access my tabs. Right, so here we could go to replace the token with a year. Save that. And we'll uh, So we have uh, copyright 2020. We can actually use tokens, you know, to place in a specific block and do that. Although we are on a node page, um, keep in mind that if you place something like a node token, it's not going to be processed because it's actually going to be called from a block entity and block entity have no idea if it's loaded on a node. So if you put a node ID, it's not going to give you anything. Uh, I, I read, but I actually haven't ex experimented with it. If you, if you use entity, some sort of en entity uh, tokens, you might get lucky. But I didn't go that far. So if I'll quickly go again to the list of my Tokens. Let's see what sort of entity tokens are there. Nothing. Yeah, I'm not going to dig that deep. Anyway, if, if you're feeling experimental, you really want to get the uh, Already from that, you can do it, but if you say node ID here, refresh this page, it should just disappear. No, it didn't process it because it couldn't replace it. Okay. So, yeah, keep in mind that uh, the tokens put in there are either global tokens or uh, block specific token, so tokens. So, um, yeah, feel free to jump there. So to finish it up, I'll just mention that there is a module called um, MetaTag, which heavily relies on module and deploying the configuration of the MetaTag. Is actually heavily uh, involves tokens. So, Manage defaults, global. You can see there is uh, yeah a lot of tokens are used to uh, for the global settings for MetaTag. So MetaTag is actually a heavy user of the token module. A uh, few people uh, mentioned that there are tokens in views, but they're actually different tokens. They use uh, now tweak placeholders. So for example, if you have a view of the content. And if you do want, want to display how many results are there in your header, it's called replacement patterns. Available global token replacement patterns. Actually, it is a token. So uh, in fields, it would use the weight things. But here, uh, total results. So there's a page count, items per page, total rows.
So we'll save that. And go to our content. And I can see where it is. Do content page, page. Two requests, hang on. But you got the idea. So, so let's put it in here. It should have a header. There we go. Or maybe it was a cache. So total records 42. And we can, can use tokens of all views. Again, this is just the introduction to how to use tokens. You, you can a bit more creative you can go a bit more um, you know actually define your own tokens so but that's pretty much it for 20 minute presentation thanks for listening if you have any questions do let me know someone has a question someone has a question Ooh, Ooh, Yeah, I've got a question. What was that um, uh, search module you were using there, uh, Vladimir? Uh, search, search? It had go to at the top there. It's in the Can Claro team. The new team. It's a new admin team, Claro. So that has that option. Can you go back to your um, admin interface, son? Um, it works similarly to coffee. <laughs> coffee, is it? Not coffee, but it's <laughs> no. That okay. So yeah, I got I got the question. Yeah. So this was particular. I was using coffee. Yep. So that was coffee. So this go to was a coffee. But there is also a search as of Drupal eight point seven. I think it's enabled with uh, this search provided. I'm not really sure, but I think it's provided by admin toolbar. I still find coffee is a bit more, you know, Mac kind of feeling. So it does have this um, spotlight interface, whereas the search, which again, I think is the tool, tool bar, provides more results, which is sometimes if you're looking for pages with a lot of results, it actually, uh, this search provides more results. And again, I think this is an admin toolbar, but uh, coffee, I, I just enabled admin toolbar and coffee together. Hey, Vola. I have a question for you. Uh, uh, is the are the tokens supported by the language, or how does that work with language? Good question. Uh, we are on multilingual theme. Uh, let's quickly have a look. Extend. Let's see if there are any multilingual. I actually haven't noticed any difference uh, with the token patterns, but let's just have a look. So we have multilingual nodes. So if we go to So there is no language code. So if uh, you know how multilingual is structured, uh, there would be two different nodes, node IDs, really. So if you look at the structure here in Umami, uh, there is a Spanish recipe and there is a, so here is Spanish recipe and there is a, 
and there is an uh, English recipe. So it depends on which one you actually can get the language of the particular node. Is there anything more specific you want to find out? Oh, good. I'm glad. Uh, us here in Wellington are going to need to wrap up in just a moment uh, because it, we are running a little bit later than you guys here in New Zealand. Um, if, if people would like to do more q and A, I I think that um, that's a fantastic idea because um, that was a really good presentation. I want to quickly from our end just say thank you and talk about that. Yeah. Not only is it interesting content, um, but it also proves that we can effectively make this trans Tasman uh, content sharing work, um, including when it's technical. Um, so yeah, just that's, that's, that's really great. Um, I would like to start sort of wrapping up on, on, on our end, just because it is getting late. I know people need to catch trains. Um, so yeah, wanted to say uh, again, just a huge thank you to everyone who was able to participate. I can see that there's dozens and dozens of people, um, potentially from all around the world, we don't even know. Um, so this has been a very successful experiment. Um, a huge thank you to local meetup organizers uh, in, in uh, Sydney, Brisbane, Auckland, Canberra. Why don't you get everybody who joined in just to post on the Wellington Google Meetup page? That, that's, a, that's a fantastic idea. Um, just so we've got um, an idea of who was actually in attendance tonight, um, we would love it uh, if you could just write a one-liner just saying who you are and where you came from. I'm going to put a link to that right here. Boom. Um, if you're a member of meetup.com, uh, please jump in. Just leave us a comment. Uh, give us any feedback on how tonight's content sharing session went. Uh, we'll read through that and report back to the committee. Um, but yeah, otherwise, just again, huge thank you to all of our, uh, our co-organizers all around Australasia. Um, big thanks to Tom Two Goods uh, in Auckland for providing the Zoom link tonight. Uh, thank you to the Wellington Drupal Meetup sponsors, Catalyst IT and X equals. Um, and, uh, we otherwise, sorry, sorry, Tom. Thank you very much, Alex, for, for uh, you know MC this night. It's been great. Oh, thanks, Ray. Much appreciated. Well, we are going to put ourselves on mute and we'll start wrapping up. But if you guys want to keep talking, we'll hear you in the background. Um, so, so otherwise, a few thanks. Last question from Vladimir. Ah, and one last question from Tom for Vladimir. Uh, which is, uh, why do you think, do you think there's uh, ever going to be a Drupal 8 or Drupal 9 port of token alias? I actually haven't used token alias myself. But, uh, just bring up yeah. the token alias project page for a laugh. It's just my last. It's just my last joke. So it's Drupal.org project token underscore alias. Let's try for the best, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A <laughs> uh, you can look on here, Tom, so it's screen shares. Oh, okay, you've got it there. Yeah. Very good. All right, good stuff. We're going on mute. Thanks again, Vladimir. See you next month. We'll try this again. See you. See you. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. <laughs> All right, so I think we are fine now. We can talk in first person now. <laughs> Chris, it's like you were on the screen. I'm sorry? You are on the screen. I was, but not now because the camera is not facing me now. <laughs> <laughs> now it's Rookie or Ajit probably. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but this was a, this was, no, because we um we were, since we're doing a kind of joint one with Wellington, we managed to get the data because we found it twice. Yeah. And then just get some